These are the people of Norilsk, a city built by gulag labor in the Arctic wilderness of northern Siberia, and all of them are former gulag prisoners, sent here by Stalin to dig for nickel, platinum and copper in the Arctic permafrost. It's one of the harshest places in the world, dark for seven months a year, with winter frosts of minus 45 degrees. They're singing about the pain of exile and separation. Why aren't you writing to tell me where you are? Tell me how many years I have to wait for you. And yet, they're proud of their survival in this harsh climate. They're proud of this city, which they've gouged out of the frozen earth with their own hands. We don't know how many thousands die building Norilsk. Their bones are part of its foundations, but they're proud of the special strength of spirit which they've needed to survive. I've come here to Norilsk with Memorial, my partners in a project to document the personal histories of Stalinist repression, which have gone into my new book, The Whisperers. Why Norilsk? because it seems to me that it represents the essence of Stalin's legacy and all the paradoxes that his regime left behind. Norilsk is a city whose population of 130,000 people is nearly all made up of former Gulag prisoners and their descendants. Yet they live side by side with the old administrators of the labour camps who also chose to stay here when the Gulag mining complex was transferred to the Ministry of Heavy Industry after Stalin's death in 1953. Today, they sit together at this round table, which we've organised to discuss how the gulag should be remembered. Former prisoners and their jailers toast each other and recall the past. There's no bitterness or conflict between them. Civic pride unites them. And no one speaks of guilt or victimhood, or about the moral collision between perpetrators and victims. As a Westerner, I'm fascinated by this unity. I think it raises awkward and disturbing questions about the nature of the Soviet system and about repression and its legacies. Vasily Ramashkin has lived in Norilsk for 70 years. He came here as a prisoner in 1937 and remained as a voluntary worker after his release in 1953. He's proud of his contribution to the Soviet economy, even as a gulag prisoner, and for his interview appeared smartly dressed in a dark suit wearing all his Soviet medals. As for these medals here, they're all winners of socialist competitions, as you can see. Yes, I was a winner of non-ferrous metallurgy in an all-Russian competition. These over here are veteran of the Norilsk complex and veteran of the USSR. They're awarded for valiant and dedicated labor. Lots of people say it's time to come to terms with our history of repression. Do you think that's possible? Well, why not? It's something that lies in the past, when I was working here and digging. You see, when they said that we were enemies of the people, the way we felt was that we were prepared to work here all our lives just so that they stopped thinking of us like that. <laughs> Natalia Galubiatnikova, former state prosecutor in Norilsk. We need reconciliation. We can't live in two separate camps, says Natalia, who came to Norilsk as a volunteer with the Komsomol, the Communist Youth League, in 1946, and worked here in the administration of the Gulag. It's easy to imagine that what she really wants is to be forgiven by the people she once sent to the labour camps. But what these people have been saying here makes me think that things are more complex, that the division between Stalin's collaborators and his victims is perhaps not as simple as black and white in moral terms as we may like to think, that many people found themselves in both these camps at various times, perpetrators who became victims, prisoners who found a way of life through the gulag, and that the barbed wire fence dividing them in places like Norilsk 
united them as well in many ways. We'll be returning to Nuriilsk, but first I want to take you on a journey through the history of the Gulag to explore how and why these possible positions, from collaboration with the Stalinist regime to concealed dissent and open opposition, were reached by individuals. The largest of the early penal labour camps, with more than 100,000 prisoners by 1932, was used to build the White Sea Canal, one of Stalin's greatest follies. 227 kilometres of redundant waterway connecting the Baltic with the White Sea. Soviet propaganda sold the project as a bold attempt by the state to engineer a new type of human soul, reforging, Pidikovka they called it. Criminals, and that meant anyone from petty thieves to murderers, priests or simply peasants labelled as class traitors by the Soviet regime, would supposedly find redemption through corrective labour in the Gulag's camps. In reality, the White Sea Canal was dug by hand with primitive tools and many thousands died from exhaustion. That is Ida Slavina, and a poem of 1936 by Pavel Kogan, which Ida cites as an example of the spirit of those times, when people thought that history was marching forward, and in Kogan's lines, dreamers were prepared to believe everything, without arguing, to throw themselves headlong under the tractor. It equally describes her father's life. Ilya Slavin was a major figure in the field of Soviet law. In 1931, he wrote a book commissioned by the Communist Academy as part of the regime's purge of the legal academic establishment. Several of the jurors Slavin had attacked for their bourgeois stance were subsequently sacked. Having proved himself as a hardliner, Ilya was given a new task by the police chiefs of the Gulag to write a book on the reforging of penal labourers by the White Sea Canal. In essence, he was asked to justify the Gulag labour camps. Ilya had long believed in the idea of reforging, but what he saw in the labour camps of the White Sea Canal destroyed his beliefs. Of course he wasn't able to see everything, but he did see some things that disturbed him very much. The first time he came back from the White Sea Canal, he fell into a deep depression. He'd seen what things were like out there. There were children there, atrocities. He hadn't thought it possible to see such things in a Soviet labour camp. After that, he didn't tell us anything more. He couldn't talk about these things, but I know he changed his views. Ilya couldn't bring himself to write the book. He tried to put it off. Under growing pressure, in 1935 he submitted some draft chapters in which he drew attention to what he bravely called distortions in the policy of reforging, for which he was sharply criticised. His situation was hopeless. Writing the book would have saved his life, but he couldn't do it morally, and the longer he delayed, the closer he would move, as he surely knew, to his own arrest. I am finished. Ilya wrote in 1937, a political bankrupt. Three weeks later, he was arrested and shot. People changed a lot, you know. They really changed a lot. The labour camp reformed them. Evgenia Wittenberg spent her childhood in the labour camps. She still believes that she saw real reforging there. Criminals reformed through physical labour. I played the guitar in the orchestra in my father's labour camp and our conductor was a convicted murderer. Slava was his name. Lovely boy. Maybe you're wondering how I felt about that. Whether I thought that he was a bad person. Well, no. 
I got on very well with everyone. Well, I was just a girl then. I must have been about 13. All the other members of the orchestra were criminals, but my parents still let me take part. They didn't think it was dangerous. Yevgeny's father, Pavel, was a leading figure in the world of Soviet geology and polar exploration, who played a vital role in the development of the Arctic gulags. Arrested in 1931, he was sent first to the gulag at the White Sea Canal. But his expertise as a geologist meant that he was soon transferred to the Arctic island of Vygatch, where the gulag needed qualified geologists to look for gold and other minerals that could be mined by prisoners. Although still a prisoner himself, Pavel lived in comfortable conditions and published several articles in official journals about his work. He was joined on the island by his wife, Zina, who worked as a doctor in the labour camp. On arriving, she wrote to her family. Papachka looks very well. He's put on weight. His face is an excellent colour, without a single wrinkle. His mood is good. He's full of energy and, as always, happy in his work. We are living very well in a house for specialists. Remarkably, in fact, if you stop to think that this is the 70th parallel. We have two delightful rooms, each with three windows, so they're very light. There is an enormous stove with an oven, so I shall have to improve my housekeeping skills, which I have completely lost. There is a wonderful reforging of people happening here. All the prisoners return to the mainland as qualified, literate and conscious workers. If only we could reforge more like that. Yevgenia says that her mother's belief in reforging through penal labour was genuinely held, not just written for the census' sake. Her mother joined the party and helped the prisoners to learn a craft in the belief that this would help reforge their personality and rehabilitate them to society. Generally speaking, father was a real idealist, a romantic. And personally, I'm of the view that it's precisely such romantics who can save our world. Pavel also went along with the propaganda view of the Gulag. His work was clearly flourishing in the environment of a labour camp where everything he needed was provided for, as he himself confessed in his diary. How pleasant to be working at Vygatch. There's an almost military discipline and obedience among the workers here. In 1935, Pavel was released, six years before the completion of his sentence. But he stayed on as a volunteer to finish his research on the island of Vygatch. He then went to work as a geologist in the construction of the Moscow-Volga Canal, another gulag building project in which countless thousands died, while his family returned to the capital and a comfortable new flat. Father was never a careerist, always striving to share everything with his students. He had a broad and generous attitude. That's how scientists were in those days. Perhaps this is true, that Pavel worked for science without self-interest. But it's the viewpoint of a loving daughter who cherishes the memory of her father. From a different perspective, Pavel's actions could be seen as a moral compromise. Perhaps it suited him to close his eyes to the harsh realities of the gulag, where his career was flourishing. At some point, he surely crossed a moral line, when he ceased to be a prisoner and became a collaborator in the gulag system to advance his own research. <laughs> Survivors of the camp sing love songs from their old Ukrainian villages, villages that were destroyed during Stalin's collectivization of agriculture. The labor camps of the White Sea Canal were filled with people like this, peasants or kulaks arrested and exiled in that insane war against the peasantry to wipe out potential opposition to the large collective farms. Soviet Russia was nothing if not a peasant country, and in the 1920s, millions of small-scale peasant farms, like the one belonging to the Gulovins, were destroyed. The Gulovins were a family of six farming just four hectares of scrubby land in Vologda, North Russia. To earn a little extra, they made shoes. For this, they were branded as kulaks, supposedly capitalist exploiters, which could mean anyone the local party activists thought might speak out against the collective farms. For the Gullivans, this meant that their farm was broken up and they were expelled from the village where their ancestors had lived for centuries. The father was sent to a labour camp on the White Sea Canal. 
His older brothers and sons fled, while his wife and youngest children were exiled to Siberia. Among them was his daughter Antonina. You people from the town probably just accepted what they said about the Kulaks, that they were enemies of the people, exploiters who took bread from the people's mouths. But I've seen with my own eyes what a Kulak was. I had seen how hard my father worked. Sometimes I would have to sit up late until one in the morning to get all my homework done. But Papa would always still be up, sitting on his chair and doing some sewing. And in the morning too, when I got up to go to school, he would already be working. He'd be up at daybreak to do some extra job before his work. So that's the kind of Kulak I grew up with. <laughs> Propaganda stirred up hatred against the Kulaks nationwide. This was the start of the campaign of terror against enemies, and many of those picked on as Kulaks were forced out violently, like Valentina's family. It's very painful to remember this. They burnt everything, literally everything. They even burnt our cow and our pig. They tried to burn us too. I'm telling you, they set fire to our house one night. I was only two. It's my earliest memory. I remember the screams, noises of the animals, and being carried out by my father. There were soldiers on horses. Mama was lucky to escape. Her arms were covered in burns, and on her back there were even bigger scars. There were kulak quotas to be filled. And sometimes they were chosen randomly, as Dmitri Strelitsky, whose family was exiled to a penal settlement in Siberia, found out when he returned to his native village in 1948. I met the chairman of the village Soviet, who explained that he'd authorized our deportation. I received this directive to find 17 Kulak families and make arrangements for their eviction, he said. There'd been a directive, that was true. He said, you know, I had to work with this committee of poor peasants and we managed to put some individual farmers on the list, but there still weren't enough. So we made up the numbers with people chosen randomly from the collective farm. That's why your family ended up on our list. <laughs> this day, uh, uh, well, all right, it's better to forget we asked Dmitri whether exile placed a strain on family relations. There were 14 people in his family. Listen, it was very difficult in exile. Our ration was only 200 grams of bread. But the bread would arrive at the distribution point as these huge loaves of three kilograms apiece. They were huge rye loaves, about the span of a man's arms. They cut them into chunks, about as thick as a book, to give out as rations. One of us had to go to the distribution point and bring the chunk we'd been allotted home. We were all hungry and cold, so it wasn't really a question of getting on with each other. <laughs> I got a stick and tied a thread to it and constructed this balance. Hang one of these chunks of bread from each of the two ends and check that everyone was getting an equal share. If there was any imbalance, we'd take out a crumb from the heavier chunk until both sides were even. Then we'd share out all the crumbs that were left on the table. That way everyone received an equal share. But soon the children would get hungry and argue. He got more! He got more! Millions of Kulak families were exiled to penal settlements in remote regions of Siberia and the far north, where they were put to work in logging camps, or simply left to fend for themselves. Kulak children, like Antonina, Valentina and Dmitri, were now also burdened with the stigma of a spoilt biography. In her memoirs, Antonina remembers an incident at school when she was 12 years old. A new teacher joined our school. Now, of course, like all children, we played up with her a bit, especially the big boys who were sitting at the back. Being the shortest child in the class, I was sitting at one of the front desks, so I couldn't actually see what mischief they were getting up to behind me. But anyway, we were having our lesson when all of a sudden our teacher became red with rage and started shouting at us, You hooligans, enemies of the people. 
filthy kulaks. You were exiled for good reason, and should all be left to rot instead of wasting time trying to teach you. The whole class went quiet. Someone started crying. Our teacher eventually stopped shouting, set us a task to copy something out, and stormed out of the classroom. That's when I had this feeling in my gut that we, the kulaks, were different from all the rest, that we were seen as criminals, and things that others could do were forbidden to us. Looking back, that was the moment when I began to suffer from an, an inferiority complex, which I've had ever since. This fear lodged itself in my soul that they could do anything they wanted to us, that we had no rights and had to keep quiet. To be honest, that fear has never left me. I've lived all my life with my soul eaten up by fear. Many children felt a sense of shame and resentment because of their kulak origins, which blocked their path to higher schools and jobs. They yearned to be accepted as an equal by society, to join the pioneers and the Komsomol as other children did, to prove their worth by studying hard and paradoxical, though it may appear, by working for the Soviet system, a system that had oppressed their own families. The only way to escape the stigma of oppression was to prove themselves as loyal Soviet citizens. After their house was burnt down, Valentina's father was sent to a labour camp in the far east. While she and her mother roamed the country, living off their earnings from various casual jobs, her childhood memories are dominated by the feeling of hunger. Ну что, даже со школы, если я во вторую смену училась, а с утра есть нечего, и если мама во вторую смену работала в школе. When I was at school, and Mama worked as a cleaner. We had nothing to eat at home, so she and I would go out at night into the harvested fields to collect the frozen remains of the rotten potatoes. We made flat cakes and dumplings out of them. Now my liver's all messed up because of what I ate from hunger as a child. I was always hungry. In 1932, there was a famine. I hardly ever saw a loaf of bread. To get one from the shop was like a holiday. Valentina studied hard at school. She saw education as an escape from poverty. She was a true believer in the communist ideal and thought that Stalin was the greatest human being in the whole of history. She believed the party's propaganda about spies and enemies and dreamed of becoming a lawyer so that she could help to hunt them down. In fact, she took a job as a bookkeeper at a naval base on the island of Sakhalin, where she married a naval officer. There, she was recruited by the NKVD, the political police, to write reports on the wives of other officers. During our interviews, she revealed for the first time to anyone that she had been an informer, and spoke about her work for the police with a bizarre mixture of pride and shame. They'd ask, "Do you know so and so's wife, or so and so's perhaps?" They wanted me to give them information about officers' wives at the naval base. There were three of them, the men I was meant to report to. They always treated me extremely well. They'd take me out to restaurants and other nice places. My husband knew all about it. They paid me well for these reports. The wives I'd reported would later be summoned for interrogation by the police. I'm sure their husbands were all spies. They told me how to make contact with these wives. One liked to make clothes, for example, so they gave me money to commission things from her. I've still got some of the dresses that she made for me. Another one I paid for various errands and so on. It wasn't just a question of making their acquaintance. I had to win their trust. They made me become an informer. I would have got into trouble if I'd refused. And it wasn't as if I had to inform against them all the time. It was really just a question of seeing whether people who didn't belong were visiting their homes and listening to their conversations. Valentina worked as an informer for several years. Many people were arrested because of her reports. She was paid well enough to buy a house and retire at the age of thirty-nine, but she still sees herself as a victim of repression. Because she was forced to work for the police, I wonder how we should interpret Valentina's motives. 
communist belief or material gain or perhaps a combination of them both. I always felt myself to be well a second class person, always. I always felt that there was someone following me, checking up on me, that I had to be careful, you know, vigilant, not to get myself into trouble. I, I, I could never get rid of this idea. Dmitry Strelecki was brought up to believe that school could lift the shadow of his Kulak birth. Father said to me, just make sure to study hard. Don't worry about anything else. You'd often repeat this reflection of his. That's the good thing about Soviet power, that it gives you an education. So mind you, study hard. So I went to school. Dmitri was the first boy from the penal settlement to finish school. With the help of the police chief of the settlement, he went to Pierm University, but he was bullied by the students because of his Kulak origins. Dmitri fled from institute to institute, experiencing the same discrimination, until finally, in desperation, he returned to the special settlement where he became a teacher. He'd come back to his prison. Yet his faith in Stalin and the Soviet system was unshakable. He believed in the show trials and in the need to fight against the enemies of the people, even though he'd been repressed as one of them. A paradox he now tries to explain to himself. I believed. I believed in everything. I believed the trials. My family believed too, and we weren't the only ones. Everyone believed in them. I mean, if that's what they tell you at school, if that's what you hear on the radio, if that's what you read in the newspapers, you couldn't believe in them. I never had the slightest doubt. I even thought it was the enemies of the people who had deported us. That it was a mistake and that Stalin would save us. We believed in Stalin. We believed in him. Perhaps all this faith, as I've come to see it now, well, I wonder whether this faith may perhaps have somehow influenced our way of thinking, those who were repressed. Perhaps it was a form of self-deception, that somehow it made life easier to bear. Believing in the justice of Stalin made it easier for us to accept our punishments, and it took away a bit of our fear. That's how I see it, anyway. In 1941, Dmitri volunteered for the Red Army. Kulaks were forbidden from serving in the ranks until 1942, so Dmitri was put into the penal labour battalions and sent to a lumber camp surrounded by a high barbed wire fence where he was in prison for the next five years. After his release, he found casual work until his first official job in 1952 as an engineer in a ship repairing yard. Only then did he apply to join the party something that would finally give him the social acceptance and equality he craved. He believed in the party, but the party didn't believe in him. More than 50 years later, Dmitri still finds it painful to talk about the episode. Well, that was it as far as I was concerned. This whole business caused me so much anguish. Didn't know how I... I was really desperate. This stayed with me for the rest of my life. I desperately wanted to join the party. I was always for the communists, and I believed all of us in our family believed in Soviet authority. I thought that by being a communist, I'd be able to do more for my country to be more use. What was I thinking, you may ask? A cool like son in the party? Anyway, I really did suffer a lot after my application fell through. It was a stayed with me for the rest of my life. There was a friend of mine, for example. His brother was a hero of the Soviet Union. Well, he wasn't a particularly bright student. Well, he got a post at the Sverdlov factory here in Pyrmany, and a whole laboratory at his disposal. 
He had every possible opportunity, was I? Why couldn't I have the same chance? I was a better student than him, so why couldn't I have the same chance? Well, now you see how all this wounded me. The hurt stayed with me for the rest of my life. What people say today is one thing, what they thought yesterday another. I suspect that there were more conformists like Dmitri than there were hidden dissidents. After all, the Soviet system couldn't have lasted as long as it did without the acquiescence and compliance of millions of Dmitris. Can we really believe those who say they were secretly opposed to the system? This is one of the many questions that makes the story of our third Kulak child so interesting. Antonina Golovina studied hard at school, but like Dmitri, she was always held back by her Kulak origins. At the age of 18, it would send her to the labour camps if she was exposed. And she did this so that she could go to medical school. Antonina never spoke about her family to any of her friends or colleagues at the Institute of Physiology in Leningrad, where she worked for 40 years. She also hid the truth from her husband and their daughter, who was born in 1948. Antonina told us how she lived this secret life. She'd never spoken openly about it before. The thing that's driven me my whole life is not to reveal myself. I'm always careful not to say too much. I always think before I speak to make sure that no one can guess my secret, my spoiled biography. Even when Perestroika began, I was still scared to talk when strangers were around. It's only now that things are easier. But even now, I won't come out of my shell, only with family. This fear stays with you for your whole life, really. It never goes away. You know, I have really nice neighbors. They are good friends, but I'd never tell them about my past. What could I tell them? That I was exiled? No, I suppose I've lived a lie. A deceit. But Mama always said, when you live with wolves, you must learn to live like wolves. In 1961, still concealing her secret, Antonina joined the Communist Party. Not because she believed in its ideology, or so she claims, but because she wanted to divert suspicion from herself and protect her family. When I decided to make my way into the party, Yes, I joined the party. Why are you surprised? How else could I get on in my profession? If I wasn't in the party, I would never have been able to climb as high as I did in my profession. Simple as that. I went to all the party meetings at the Institute. I was one of the main activists, but it was all camouflage. I needed to conceal my Kulak origins, and I thought that joining the party would do that. I was also very worried about my daughter's future. I didn't want her to know anything about our family's past. I wanted her to feel that her mother was just like all the other parents of the children at her school, which was one of those elite schools for party members. I didn't believe. How could I? I joined to help my career. For over 40 years, she concealed the truth about her past from her husband. They rarely spoke to one another about their families, until one day, when an elderly aunt of Antonina's husband paid them a visit and let slip that his father was a Tsarist naval officer who'd been executed by the Bolsheviks in 1917. All these years, without knowing it, Antonina had been married to a man who, like her, had spent his early years in labor camps and special settlements. Soviet propaganda portrayed the war, the great patriotic war, as a triumph for the system. After 1945, the victory became the legitimizing principle of the Soviet regime, the justification for everything that it had done since 1917. But in the popular consciousness, the war was a people's war, one in spite of Stalin and the party's leadership, a time when people by necessity acted on their own initiative, a time of freedom when they ceased to be whisperers 
but spoke out openly and helped each other without thinking of the political dangers to themselves. And from this spontaneous activity, a new sense of nationhood emerged. The war, in short, was a time of spontaneous de-Stalinization. <laughs> For millions of soldiers, especially for those who marched through Europe, the war was a moment of political awakening. Lev Neto was just 19 in 1943 when he was dropped behind the German lines to organize the Latvian and Estonian partisans. Lev's mother was a Latvian, his father Estonian, and he was brought up in Moscow as a Soviet patriot. His younger brother, Igor, was a football star, later to become the captain of the Soviet national side. Lev was captured by the Germans and marched to a POW camp in Dvinsk, where a hostile reception by the local Latvian population raised awkward questions in his mind. So, finally, we got to the POW camp in Dvinsk, and it was here that things started to become clear to me. They marched us from the railway station through the city, and the streets were full of Latvians. I don't know who told them to come out, probably the Germans, but anyway, they all began to shout at us. Stalinist bandits, Stalinist bandits. They threw stones at us and spat at us. I remember it very clearly. We walked on without flinching, arm in arm, supporting each other silently, looking down at the road. It, it was then that I realized what we, the Soviet army, were to them. We obviously weren't liberators, as we'd been told by our commanders, because the Latvians were so hostile. And this gave rise to these inner doubts. I began to question everything. If all this hatred was because of our Soviet system, then it clearly showed that the regime's attitude towards the people, towards the individual, was... Well... It was as if a person simply didn't count for anything. At the end of the war, people were convinced that life in the Soviet Union would improve. The alliance with Britain and the USA had opened Soviet society to Western influence. Books and films had given them a glimpse of a different way of life. People had been altered by the war. They tasted freedom and become more critical. They had expectations of political reform. Surely there'd be no return to the terror and austerity of the 1930s after all their sacrifices in the war. Reform hopes were particularly strong in the universities. Ludmila Ilyasheva, a former Leningrad student. After father's arrest and all those other mistaken arrests, after the war and its catastrophes, I became disillusioned, but not so far as to become anti-Soviet. But when I started listening to Vaznesensky's lectures and reading Marx, then I began to understand what socialism ought to be. I saw that the communist idea had nothing to do with Stalin whatsoever, that it was something completely different to what we had in the Soviet Union. Our goal, the goal of my generation, was to put the country back on its true path, to have a socialism in which there would be no more mistakes, like the one that cost my father's life. Marx's writings became Ludmilla's guide to a new political morality. Together with some friends from the university, she formed a Marxist study group, which met once a week in the public library. Not unlike the later dissidents, they were trying to discern a moral code, to find a way of living honestly without conforming slavishly to group thinking or official rules. <laughs> Yes, we'd only discuss these things amongst ourselves. There were three of us who shared the same ideas about how we should live our lives. Anybody else we saw as outsiders, especially those conformist types in the Komsomol who joined the party. One day in the public library we were standing on the staircase talking and someone said, why has there been such a long delay in calling the 19th Party Congress? 
It's an infringement of the party rules. It had been well over five years since the last party congress had been convened, and this seemed to us to be against the principles of party democracy. Then this girl, an acquaintance, said, Stalin must know best. I looked at her and thought, that's it. For me, she ceased to exist as a human being. And do you know, this woman later became the head of party history at Leningrad University. She's still alive today. The ending of the war was a crucial watershed in the labour camps of the Gulag, too. In places like Norilsk, whose precious metals were essential for the Soviet military, there was a massive influx of new prisoners. They were of a different type from the kulaks and politicals who filled the labour camps before the war. They were POWs, nationalist insurgents from the newly captured territories of the Baltic and West Ukraine, and Red Army men who'd been to Europe only to be sent to the Gulag on their return to the Soviet Union. These new prisoners were militant, mostly hostile to the Soviet regime, and increasingly rebellious as the work regime and cruelty of the guards intensified in the first years of the Cold War. One of them was Lev Neto, who had returned to the Soviet Union in 1945 and rejoined the Red Army only to be rearrested as a foreign spy in 1948 and sentenced to 25 years hard labour in the Norilsk labour camp. И к 21 декабря 49 года нужно было послать в Москву подарок. By the 21st of December 1949, the factory was supposed to send this gift to Moscow, the first ingots of Norilsk copper. Первую плавку норильской меди замерзла, погибла. Lots of people froze to death. We worked in 10-hour shifts, but we also had to march back to the camp. So that meant we were outside for at least 14 hours every day, sometimes even more because of all those checks and head counts, which took up a huge amount of time. Working hard was better than having to stand around outside freezing until the guards finished counting us. If it turned out that somebody was missing at the evening count, even if it was just one person, the guards would shout, stop, and we knew we wouldn't be going anywhere until he was found. Sure, stop. Within the prison zone, secret strike committees began to form. In Lev's zone, there was a democratic party with a reading club, where they studied Marx and Lenin for ideological arguments against the Gulag system and practical instructions on how to organise a revolution in Norilsk. It was an irony that there was more freedom of ideas in the labour camps than in Soviet society. When we got together, it wasn't a formal meet or anything like that, just three, four or five people discussed the situation, exchanged opinions. The general mood was that the camp authorities were encouraging the guards' violence against us, but there couldn't be any armed uprising on our part. Even if we managed to get past the barbed wire, disarmed our guards, and turned the city of Norilsk into a safe haven, we still wouldn't be able to get any further than that, for what lay ahead of us was thousands of kilometers of taiga, forest and tundra, and in this territory the air force would soon find us and wipe us out. What's more, the people who stayed behind in Norilsk, that's tens of thousands of people and children too, or anything that was alive, would then be destroyed. In desperation, the prisoners began to arm themselves with bits of iron piping, with any weapons they could make, to defend themselves against the guards. We made these Finnish knives. If you're wondering how we went about it, well, I was working as a lathe operator in the turning shop, and I was introduced to this fellow from the smithy who made these blanks out of high-grade metal. He would pass these on to me, and I'd turn and sharpen them into the arsenal of these weapons that we managed to stock up. I suppose we were preparing ourselves, that is, we felt we had to be ready, 
But as for planning concrete actions, like, say, locating the weakest points in the guard system, observing the watchtowers, or pinpointing where the guards' barracks were, well, there was absolutely nothing of that. On the 5th of March 1953, Stalin died. The prisoners awaited their release. You see, it was right after Stalin's death, when contrary to what we've been expecting, I mean that our sentences would be commuted and that perhaps we might even be released, because the chief ideologue, the central figure who embodied this terror, had died. The situation in our camp took a completely different course. But the amnesty announced a few weeks later applied only to the criminals on short sentences. For the politicals, conditions became even worse, with continued shootings and other provocations by the guards who needed trouble from the prisoners to justify the continuation of their jobs, for they'd heard rumours that the gulag system was about to be dismantled. What we now had in the camp was a harsher regime, a crueler treatment of the prisoners, including downright terror, that is, indiscriminate killings all the time, that happened for no particular reason at all, just like that. The soldiers would shoot and kill whole groups of people together, or sometimes even picking them off one by one. And they weren't punished at all for this. It was clear that this was being done quite deliberately. As far as we could tell, it had something to do with the restructuring of the Gulag personnel after Stalin's death. They needed to prove that they were performing an essential task, guaranteeing the security of the state by showing that the people they were guarding were dangerous enemies of the people who were plotting all kinds of escapes, rebellions, and you name it. So that's why all these acts of cruelty were encouraged in every possible way. Of course, this gave rise to a very tense atmosphere and despair. On the 25th of May, after several prisoners were shot by the guards, a protest strike spread quickly through the prison camp. The sirens started hooting in the boiler houses. I rushed down to the street and saw Shmernov together with a group of other prisoners. What's happened, I asked. There's been another of these provocations in the fifth zone, he said. Two or three people have been killed, four injured, and the whole zone's decided that enough is enough. They want us all to lay down our work. We're not going to work anymore. We're declaring a strike. A real strike in every sense of the word. Slogans began appearing. Ours was freedom or death. We wanted to communicate that we preferred to die than to go on living in this way. So go ahead and kill us. Or send a commission to investigate why all this is happening, why they're shooting at us every day. About 1,500 prisoners were gathered in the barracks of our zone. These black flags were raised as a kind of protest against the killings. The camp administration immediately withdrew from our zone. But soon they started trying to win us over psychologically by asking us why we'd gone on strike and assuring us they'd look into all our grievances. Well, there were talks. <laughs> but it's clear we were dealing with the same bosses who'd turned a blind eye to all the abuses. So we said, no, we've heard enough of your smooth words. We'll only talk to a commission from Moscow. People ask me, weren't you scared? But you know, I never really thought about it. I wasn't scared. I don't think any of us were, because we'd all been officers or soldiers in the war, and we came close to death before. 
That's why we were ready to fight in the Rilsk, why we were prepared to die if necessary. Infra Kopak, infra ruble. But the thing is, we were all convinced there was something good to be fought for. We were fighting not for our freedom, but to liberate our country. That's why we weren't scared of death. The insurgents locked themselves into their barracks and demanded to negotiate with the authorities in Moscow. Despite their apocalyptic slogans, what they wanted was relatively moderate and not anti-Soviet at all. They wanted to be treated with respect. Moscow sent negotiators, who pleaded with the strikers to return to work. Most complied, but several thousand fought pitched battles with the Soviet troops. By mid-July, the uprising had been put down, but smaller strikes and demonstrations continued in Norilsk and other labour camps throughout 1953, until the Gulag system was dismantled and its prisoners released. In Norilsk the today, the memory of the Gulag is just beneath the surface of public consciousness. After 1953, when the Gulag came to an end, the people of Norilsk were fully integrated into all the usual institutions of Soviet rule. Schools, pioneer and Komsomol organizations, party cells and so on, which helped to create a Soviet consciousness and to some extent a local Soviet patriotism based on their pride in Norilsk that overlaid the memory of the Gulag. These former prisoners are proud of their achievements in Norilsk, a city they built with their hands. They think Norilsk is beautiful, call it our little Leningrad, and ask if we see the resemblance. No one seems to notice that the atmosphere in this ugly smokestack city is permanently poisoned with toxic yellow fumes in which no trees or plants can grow. Norilsk represents a startling paradox. A large, industrial city built and populated by gulag prisoners whose civic pride is rooted in their own slave labour for the Stalinist regime. For me, Lev Neto is a true Russian hero. He freed himself from slavery and proved his civic courage. But his democratic form of patriotism is a far cry from the official nationalism, begun by Stalin and peddled now by Putin, which is based on the achievements of the Soviet Union, above all its victory of 1945. Only recently, Putin called on Russia's schoolteachers to give a more positive assessment of the Stalin period. There are lots of Russians who still long for Stalin. One recent poll revealed that 42% of the Russian people and 60% of those over 60 years of age favour the return of an authoritarian leader like Stalin. This nostalgia is only loosely linked with politics and ideology. For older people, it has more to do with the emotions invested in the remembrance of their youth, when the shops were full of goods, when there was social order and security, when their lives were organised and given meaning by the simple goals of the five-year plans and the Soviet Union was a real power in the world. Natalia Golubyatnikova, the state prosecutor from Norilsk, speaks for them. I really believe it is possible to love our country's history in the Stalin period. That's what I say to the children I meet. Why should one not be able to love Stalin? I will start off from 1917 and explain how our country kept advancing all the time. I tell them about all the results it achieved, how in effect it became the most powerful country in the world, how it defeated the enemy. There are lots of positives. There were mistakes from here and there. But some people try to make out that Stalin herded everyone to the camps. I don't think that's true. You see, when Stalin died, they opened his safe. And can you imagine how many denunciations against the wives of great public figures they found there? But the point is that he didn't allow anything to be done against them. No, we really must love our country. We need a fatherland. Today, the government of President Putin is attempting to normalize the violence of the Soviet experience, to replace the popular memory of Stalin's terror with official myths of Russia's greatness. 
but that memory is still heard in words and songs. I left Norilsk with the words of this song ringing in my ears. It comes from a poem by Pushkin, Uznik, the prisoner. We're free birds in truth. It's time, brother's time. But will it ever be time for the Russians to confront these awkward and uncomfortable questions about their country and themselves? What happens to a society that refuses to come to terms with its past? Doesn't it need truth and reconciliation in order to move on? It's most likely that my book, The Whisperers, will never make it into Russian. It touches a raw nerve. My partners in this project have been Memorial, which itself is coming under pressure from the Russian government. Memorial began in the first surge of Glasnost, simply as an organisation dedicated to recovering the memory, the bare facts of what had happened to so many millions during the time of Stalin. Only now, through our collaboration, have we begun to understand the inner life and torment, the moral compromises and personal betrayals, the pain of families ripped apart, the love and courage and the sheer resilience that kept people going through these impossible times. In the archive hour, Stalin's Silent People. The readers were Angela Bengo, Barry Clayton, Ken Cranham, Liz Daniels, Edna Dore, Gabrielle Downey, Brenda Dowsett, Michael Poole, and Joanna Tinsey. The program was written and presented by Orlando Figes, and the producer was Mark Berman. Well, after the news, John Fortune.